guide them over our lives, nation, as we go through this difficult, challenging time. We ask for healing, cure, comfort for families. We ask for grace upon those who have lost a loved one. We ask for the grace of God to be upon each one of us in this. Almighty God, by whom alone King reigns, and princes decree justice, and from whom alone cometh all counsel, wisdom, and understanding, we, thy unworthy servants, here gather together in thy name. Do most humbly beseech thee to send down the heavenly wisdom from above to direct and guide us in all our consultation. Grant we have it in thy fear always before our eyes, and laying aside all private interests, prejudices, and partial affections. The result of all our counsel may be to the glory of thy blessed name, the maintenance of true religion and justice, the safety, honor, and happiness of the Queen, the public will, peace, and tranquility of St. Lucia, and the uniting and meeting together of the hearts of all persons and estates within the same, in true Christian love and charity, one towards another, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Good, good morning, honorable members. This being the first sitting of the year, let me take the opportunity to wish every member, family, and Lucia in general, happy 2021. Let's all have a very productive and blessed year. Honorable members, I have received excuses from the following members. The Honorable Member for Castro Central informing that she'll be late. And the Honorable Member for V4 South, who is unwell. I beg to announce that since the last sitting of Parliament, His Excellency has been pleased to attend the following bills. Credit reporting, economic substance amendment. Let me take the opportunity also at this time to express condolences to Mr. Claudius Francis, former President of the Senate, Honorable Herman Gil Francis, Minister of Home Affairs, Justice and National Security, and His Worship Peterson Francis, Mayor of Castries, on the passing of the Father, the Honorable, on the Father, Mr. Leon Joseph Francis, CPM and JP. Also, like to take the opportunity to express, I believe, on behalf of us all, to the leader of the opposition on the passing of his brother. Honorable members, I have received a letter from the Speaker of the Senate. A joint letter from the Speaker of the Senate and Speaker of the House of Commons of Canada. And I would like, just like to read it. Dear colleagues, on the occasion of your country's Independence Day, it is our pleasure on behalf of the Parliament of Canada to extend our warmest congratulations and best wishes to you and the people of St. Lucia. Let us take this opportunity to reiterate our commitment to bolstering the strong relationship between our parliaments through the exchange of ideas and best practices. Indeed, we believe that cooperation is the key to fulfilling the most noble aspirations of our societies and to be building resilient institutions, 
equipped to address unforeseen challenges. Please accept the assurances of our highest consideration on this special day, as well as our best wishes for the well-being of the people of St. Lucia. Yours sincerely, George Fury, Speaker of the Senate, and Anthony Rota, Speaker of the House of Commons. Honorable Leader. Honorable members, let me just correct an error that was brought to my attention. Um, I said earlier that um, the court credit reporting bill was attempted to. That's an error on my part. It was not. Did you speak of that as well? I wanted to get clarification on Okay. Mr. Speaker, it, it was not attempted to. No, it was not. Honorable members, collectively as a parliament, we continue to fight against COVID-19, and the parliament is keenly aware of its responsibility to provide a safe environment for members of parliament to conduct business on behalf of the people of St. Lucia. In light of this, we have instituted the general cleaning activities, daily sanitizing, deep cleaning of the workplaces, workspaces, and other areas within the building. Members are aware of the requirements to sanitize the hands on entry into the chamber and building regardless of their point of entry. There have been no exceptions. As a parliament, we have to ensure that the business of parliament can continue even at this time. So in an effort to adhere to the protocols of social distancing, we have made some changes within the chamber, which includes making an, an offer of masks to members and staff who require we have gone a step further and reconfigure, reconfigure our seating arrangements in this chamber, not without some challenge and a bit of inconvenience. Therefore, at any one time, there will only be nine members of parliament around the table. This would allow for social distancing because of the limited number of members around the table. Suitable accommodation for viewing of the seating has been made for members in the members' lounge or members have the option of sitting in the public gallery, of which a podium is provided for speaking. And I'm referring to the podium to Honorable Member for Denry South and Member for Libraries Bath. In the, in the event that a division is called, members who are not in the chamber would be allowed a maximum of three minutes to arrive in the chamber for the conduct of the division. Statements from ministers? Honorable Prime Minister? One quick note, all members around the table will speak from the mic. Mr. Speaker, um, I want to give some notes or some information to members of the House with regards to our 42nd anniversary of independence. Mr. Speaker, every independence is an important milestone for this country, but probably this one is one of the more significant ones we've had in a very long time. The 42nd anniversary, Mr. Speaker, offers us the opportunity to rethink the importance of our nation, to appreciate how far we have come, but more importantly, Mr. Speaker, how far we still have to go. COVID was an unexpected force of nature, Mr. Speaker, that none of us had anticipated. And certainly, Globally, we are all grappling with the fallout and the containment of COVID. My government had to think very long and hard, Mr. Speaker, 
about hosting independence this year. And even if we had made the decision to host it, which we have, what form it would take. So on February 22nd, we will be celebrating our 42nd independence anniversary. It is a celebration that will be tailored to reflect the times we're in. COVID-19 has changed how we do a lot of things and independence will be no different. However, Mr. Speaker, as I've said before, we will not let COVID define us. We must do all we can to overcome as we have done in the past. A series of virtual activities have been planned, Mr. Speaker. It includes praise and worship programs, a mask on challenge, Mr. Speaker. This is important to get our people to adhere to the protocol and understand the protection masks provide. A series of panel discussions will examine critical issues including adaptability and sustainability, sustainable economic empowerment. And in reference to the, letter, Mr. the latter, Mr. Speaker, there will be an open forum for businesses to discuss how they are staying afloat during these difficult times. But it's not all gloom, Mr. Speaker. In celebrating St. Lucia, we recognize the businesses that have contributed to the financial success of this country over the last 42 years. Mr. Speaker, our young people are the heartbeat of this nation and we will celebrate their talents and contributions. There is a feature on our sports heroes and youth parliament, Mr. Speaker. Our musicians and artists keep us upbeat, especially in these times. We've planned a legacy concert showcasing the best of, Calypso of our Calypsonians, an independent song competition on Prime Minister's play play Playlist 42. And Mr. Speaker, I'm very heartened to say that in that particular endeavor, which is a mixture of new and old artists, nearly a hundred musicians and singers and sound engineers in the project, and we have received so far 200 new artists who have applied. So a big component in wanting to do our independence is to be able to showcase our musicians and our artists who have, and I think I can say it on behalf of all of us, have been robbed over the last year of their livelihoods. If there is a sector in our society that has been more adversely affected than most, it certainly would have been our artists. And it must have been very disheartening for many of them, knowing how great Carnival was going to be last year and being in the position where almost all of the bands had been sold out, all the parties had been sold out, literally they could taste the success of the last three years of building Carnival to become our dominant, in the, our dominant uh, event of the year and for that to be deprived of them. Mr. Speaker, the Independence Parade, which is enjoyed each year, will be done differently. We have invited communities to submit videos showing how they are Resilient, the same will be done, Mr. Speaker, across the public service. So, Mr. Speaker, that incredible parade that we had which showcased the best of St. Lucia by community and by ministry, instead of actually having it as floats, we're actually now going to have videos. And I think it's going to give an opportunity, Mr. Speaker, for those same communities to bring in their artisans to help now display what makes the best of those communities and to show the resilience of this country and of our people. Mr. Speaker, the full list of activities will be published soon. I do hope that all solutions, both here and abroad, would appreciate. Our nation, like the rest of the world, has soldiered through the toughest of times, brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. But as a resilient nation, we continue to prevail. Despite the socioeconomic challenges, our country has demonstrated its resilience by pressing on towards recovery. The Independence Planning Committee is preparing the agenda for the celebration of the 42nd Independence Anniversary under the theme, A Resilient Nation, We Can and We Will. In strict adherence to the COVID-19 protocols, many of the activities have either been scaled down or trans transitioned to virtual. The Independence Planning Committee, in celebration of our 42nd anniversary of independence, is planning a number of highly visible activities. So, Mr. Speaker, 
um, I have taken the opportunity to uh, copy the schedule of activities, which I will share with all the members, but also to appeal to all St. Lucia's that this is an opportunity for us to show our patriotism. And in that patriotism about our caring of each other, to be each other's brother's keeper. And sadly, Mr. Speaker, they are members of our society that still today do not believe that COVID exists. And so I make a special appeal to them that if you're not going to do it because you want to protect yourself, do it because of our country. Do it because of your neighbors. Do it because of your fellow St. Lucians. We all have to be all in on this one to succeed, Mr. Speaker. And I hope that the opposition will join in our chorus preaching one St. Lucia and to recognize how far we have come as a country. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Papers to be laid. Honorable Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs, and the Public Service. Mr. Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers standing in my name. Statutory Instrument Number 20, sorry, 202A of 2020. COVID-19 Prevention and Control Prohibition of Assembly No. 5 Order. Statutory Instrument No. 202B of 2020, COVID-19 Prevention and Control Physical Distancing No. 5 Order. Statutory Instrument No. 202D of 2020, Excise Tax Amendment of Schedule 1 No. 17 Order. Statutory Instrument No. 207 of 2020, Fiscal Incentive, St. Clair and Associates Incorporated Order. Statutory Instrument No. 209 of 2020. Public Finance Management Act, Resolution of Parliament authorizing the Finance Minister to borrow for capital or current expenditure of government. Statutory Instrument No. 210 of 2020. Value Added Tax, Resolution of Parliament to approve Draft Value Added Tax Amendment of Schedule 3, No. 2 Order. Statutory Instrument Number 212A of 2020, COVID-19 Prevention and Control, Fees Amendment Regulation. Statutory Instrument Number 214 of 2020, Citizenship by Investment Amendment Number 2 Regulation. Statutory Instrument Number 215 of 2020, National Insurance Corporation, COVID-19, Sickness Benefit Number 3 Regulation. Statutory Instrument Number 3 of 2021, the Barclays Bank PLC Banking Business Vesting Amendment Order. Statutory Instrument Number 4 of 2021, Value Added Tax Amendment of Schedule 3, Number 2 Order. Statutory Instrument Number 6 of 2021, Excise Tax Amendment of Schedule 1, Number 1 Order. Statutory Instrument Number 7 of 2021, Fiscal Incentives, KM2 Solutions to St. Lucia LTD Order. Statutory Instrument No. 8 of 2021, Fiscal Incentives, Global Construction Management Incorporated Order. Statutory Instrument No. 9 of 2021, Customs Duties Amendment of Schedule 4 Order. Statutory Instrument No. 10 of 2021, COVID-19 Prevention and Control, Physical Distancing No. 5 Amendment Order. Statutory Instrument No. 11 of 2021, COVID-19 Prevention and Control, Prohibit Prohibition, Prohibition of assembly number one order statutory instrument number 12 of 2021 COVID-19 prevention and control physical distancing number one order statutory instrument number 13 of 2021 St. Lucia Air and Seaports Authority Seaport Tariff Amendment Regulation statutory instrument number 15 of 2021 excise tax amendment of schedule one number two order Statutory Instrument Number 16 of 2021, COVID-19 Prevention and Control, Physical Distancing Number 1 Amendment Order. Statutory Instrument Number 17 of 2021, COVID-19 Prevention and Control, Physical Distancing Number 1 Amendment Number 2 Order. Statutory Instrument Number 25 of 2021, COVID-19 Prevention and Control, 
provision of Assembly Number 1, Amendment Order, Statutory Instrument Number 26 of 21, COVID-19 Prevention and Control, Physical Distancing Number 1, Amendment Number 3, Order, Statutory Instrument Number 27 of 2021, Constitution of St. Lucia, Proclamation for Declaration of State of Emergency, Statutory Instrument Number 28 of 2021, Constitution of St. Lucia, State of Emergency Regulation, Statutory Instrument Number 29 of 2021, COVID-19, Prevention and Control, Suspension of Liquor License Order, Statutory Instrument Number 30 of 2021, COVID-19, Prevention and Control, Protocol Public Omnibus Regulation, Statutory Instrument Number 31 of 2021, COVID-19, Prevention and Control, Physical Distancing Number 1, Amendment Number 4, Order, Statutory Instrument Number 32 of 2021, COVID-19, Prevention and Control, Physical Distancing Number 1, Amendment Number 5, Order. Honorable Minister for Commerce, Industry, Enterprise Development and Consumer Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers in my name. Statutory Instrument Number 202C of 2020, Price Control Amendment Number 19, Order. Statutory Instrument Number 5 of 2021, Price Control Amendment Number 1, Order. Statutory Instrument Number 14 of 2021, Price Control Amendment Number 2, Order. Statutory Instrument Number 24 of 2021, Standards, Compulsory Standards Amendment Order. Honorable Minister for Tourism, Information, Broadcasting, Culture and Creative Industries. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I stand to lay the following papers standing in my name. Mr. Speaker, Statutory Instrument Number 206 of 2020, Tourism Stimulus and Investment, CSUN Terraces, Inc. Order. Statutory Instrument Number 208 of 2020, Tourism Stimulus and Investment, uh, Progress Palace Order. Statutory Instrument Number 211 of 2020, Tourism Investment, Drive Vacation, St. Lucia Limited Order. Statutory Instrument Number 212 of 2020, Tourism Incentive, Drive Omatic Order. Statutory Instrument Number 213 of 2020, uh, Tourism Stimulus and Investment, Green Fig Resort Limited Order. Statutory Instrument Number 1 of 2021, Tourism Incentives, Kako Sitlisi Order. Statutory Instrument of Number 2 of 2021, Tourism Incentives, Pink Papaya Limited Order. Statutory Instrument Number 18 of 2021, Tourism Incentives, Bay Gardens Order. Statutory Instrument Number 19 of 2021, Tourism Incentives, Aldante Limited Amendment Order. Statutory Instrument Number 2020, Number 20 of 2021, Tourism Stimulus and Investment, Darren Charles Investment Incorporated Order. Statutory Instrument Number 21 of 2021, Tourism Incentives, Fund Tours Inc. Order. Statutory Instrument Number 22 of 2021, Tourism Stimulus and Investment, Sil Sylvester Ambrose Order. Statutory Instrument Number 23 of 2021, Tourism Stimulus and Investment, Villa Zona Order. Motion. Honorable Prime Minister. Honorable Members, I have been informed that uh, the 
voice coming out of the mics around the, t the table is very low. Uh, so during the course of the morning, we may have to have members move to the podium. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. And where it is provided by Section 17.1 of the Constitution of St. Lucia, Cap 101, that the Governor General may, by proclamation, which shall be published in the Gazette, declare that a state of emergency exists for the purposes of Chapter 1. And whereas it is further provided by Section 17.3, of the Constitution of St. Lucia Cap 101 that the declaration of emergency shall lapse a in the case of a declaration made when Parliament is sitting at the expiration of a period of seven days beginning with the date of publication of the declaration and b in any other case at the expiration of a period of 21 days beginning with the date of the proclamation of the declaration unless it has in the meantime been approved by resolutions of the Senate and the House. And whereas it is further provided by Section 17.6 of the Constitution of St. Lucia, Cap 101, that a resolution of the Senate of the House passed for the purpose of Section 17 shall remain in force for 12 months or such shorter period as may be specified in the resolution. And whereas the Governor General by proclamation declared a state of emergency that was published in the Gazette on the third day of February 2021 as statutory instrument number 27 of 21, containing a declaration that a public emergency has arisen as a result of the occurrence of 2019 NCOV, an infection disease commonly known as COVID-19. And whereas the declaration of emergency is made, when Parliament is sitting and will expire at the end of a period of seven days, beginning with the date of publication of the Declaration, unless the Declaration is approved by resolutions of the Senate and the House. And whereas it is necessary to approve the Declaration of State of Emergency that was published in the Gazette on the third day of February 21, as st a statutory instrument number 27 of 21, containing a declaration that a public emergency has arisen as a result of the occurrence of 2019 NCOV, an infectious disease commonly known as COVID-19, for a further period of 90 days, commencing from the 11th day of February 21 and ending on the 16th day of May 2021. Be it resolved that the Parliament approved the declaration of the state of emergency that was published in the Gazette on the third day of February 21 as statutory instrument number 27 of 2021, containing a declaration that a public emergency has arisen as a result of the occurrence of 2019 NCOV, an infectious disease commonly known as COVID-19 for the further period of 90 days commencing from the 11th day of February 2021 and ending on the 16th day of May 2021. Mr. Speaker, on the 30th of January 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 as a public health emergency of international concern. This triggered an immediate national health response in St. Lucia. Between the 31st of January 2020 and the 28th of February 2020, a National Health Security Committee and National Emergency Advisory Committee were activated. On the 11th of March 2020, WHO declared COVID-19 a global pandemic 
And on the 13th of March, 2020, St. Lucia confirmed its first case of COVID-19. This led to the establishment of a command center on the 18th of March, 2020. The Governor General, by proclamation, declared a state of emergency that was published in the Gazette on the 23rd day of March, 2020, as statutory instrument number 39 of 2020, containing a declaration that a public emer emergency had arisen as a result of the occurrence of 2019 N COVID, an infectious disease commonly known as COVID-19 under the Constitution of St. Lucia, CAP 101. The proclamation made by the Governor General declaring the state of emergency was published in the Gazette on the 3rd of February 2021 as statutory instrument number 27 of 2021. The Constitution also states that the declaration of an emergency lapses in the case of a, de of a declaration made when Parliament is sitting. At the expiration, a period of seven days beginning with the date of publication of the declaration, unless it has in the meantime been approved by resolutions of the Senate and the House. Additionally, the Constitution provides that a resolution of the Senate or the House passed for the purpose of the state of emergency remains in force for 12 months or such shorter period as may be specified in the resolution and may be extended by further resolution with extension not exceeding 12 months from the date of the resolution giving effect to the extension. However, in addition to declaring a state of emergency in this instance, the Governor General has also in keeping with the Constitution passed the Constitution of St. Lucia State of Emergency Regulations, the regulations on the 3rd of February 2021. These regulations were required to exist together with the COVID-19 Prevention and Control Act number 9 of 2020, the Act, which was designed to provide for the containment of COVID-19 disease outside of the state of emergency. A curfew has been imposed from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. each day. The only persons exempted from the curfew are essential services and businesses establishments or offices that are specified under the COVID-19 prevention and control physical distancing number one order. Persons to stay in their persons are to stay in their homes during the curfew and cannot drive on the road during the curfew unless written permission is provided by the Director of National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO. A restriction is also imposed on visits to persons in isolation. In St. Lucia to date, we've recorded a total number of 1,810 confirmed cases and sadly, 20 COVID-19 related deaths. We've conducted a total number of almost 26,000 PCR tests. We've implemented protocols for the gradual reopening of our economy, the phase reopening of our tourism sector, and we've put in triggers in place that alerts us as to whether we either move forward or pull back. Today, we are at this juncture where we need to pull back. An analysis indicates that over 55% of the persons between 25, age 25 and 49 have tested positive for COVID. Our contact tracing data also indicates that most of the cases and contacts of cases are as a result of breaches in the social sector. Whilst over the last few weeks we have pulled back and limited social activities, there is still mounting evidence of social events taking place, especially in the evenings at private locations. This is among the biggest threat in our fight against COVID-19 and hence the need for the curfew, which now will allow the police to better manage and contain these illegal activities by restricting movement at those times. As it stands, Mr. Speaker, our health system has also begun to feel the full impact of the rising numbers. Although we have not been overwhelmed, if we continue without stringent measures, the effect could be dire. The state of emergency will assist our frontliners and contract tracing team immensely in their task of managing the spread 
and taking person's movement and whereabouts. Sorry. In tracking person's movement and whereabouts. There is no denying that law enforcement has been stretched at this time. Our police have not been spared from the health impact of the coronavirus. And in some cases, we've had to close down police stations and keep and deep cleaning work areas. Even while some police were waiting on test results. In addition, these challenges our police are dealing with, the breaches of COVID-19 protocols, our police have also had to manage their daily crime fighting activities. This has taken its toll and as a parliament we must accept our responsibility to in assist law enforcement in coping with this pandemic. To put it into context, between the period of the 27th of December 2020 to February 6th of 2021, the police dealt with 643 breaches to the COVID-19 protocols. And I would dare say that was not the total number. Charges have been laid in a number of these cases. The state of emergency makes it much easier for the police to enforce and manage the existing protocols while still being able to fulfill the other duty of keeping the country safe from criminal elements. As I present this to the Parliament, I'm also heartened by the extensive and unprecedented support that the state of emergency and the new protocols by the private sector and by the members of the National Emergency Management Advisory Committee, NEMAC. As a country, we are finally beginning to understand that COVID is the enemy and we can only win this war by working together. As a result, a further extension of the state of emergency is being sought for the period of 90 days commencing February 11th to May 16th to facilitate a quick response. Mr. Speaker, we have learned from our previous interventions with the state of emergency. In fact, state of emergency was extended three times from the beginning in February, sorry, in March. It is very difficult to put a state of emergency on, but it's easy to suspend it. And I want to indicate that the state of emergency is being put on in order to restrict personal movements, which is a constitutional right in our country, Mr. Speaker. And our constitution only provides us with one mechanism to fulfill that, and that is through a state of emergency. It certainly my government's intention to continue to be guided by the evidence. And as we see the numbers coming down, Mr. Speaker, and we, rec and we recognize that the COVID Prevention Act can continue to contain the situation, then we will suspend the state of emergency. But we believe at this point, given Easter, given the advent of the introduction of uh, the vaccine, of which we still don't know how effective the vaccine is going to be by itself. And let me remind us that we've only been able to secure vaccines for 20% of our population, that we believe that we are at a critical juncture and maintaining the state of emergency so that we can use curfew, whether by increasing the number of hours or by decreasing the number of hours, ought to be permissible and available to the government at this point. So again, Mr. Speaker, um, I'm very heartened by the support that we received from NEMO and its members. Prime Minister, the, the, my office, when we presented to NEMO last week, I actually went to NEMO without a recommendation, only armed with the recommendation of the Medical and Dental Association. And we offered all of the associations to opine on their proposals. We met the entire weekend with several of those associations. On the conclusion of that, Mr. Speaker, we met with NEMAC again, and an opportunity was offered to everyone um, to participate. And I want to say, Mr. Speaker, it was the sentiment of everyone that we needed to put a curfew on. 
And the only way we can put a curfew on, based on everyone's constitutional rights, Mr. Speaker, is by declaring a state of emergency. But I want to say that the COVID-19 act that we've put in place has served us well. But sadly, given the inability to cause persons to adhere fully to the protocols we're putting in place and the breaches that are obvious to all of us, it is necessary for us to be here today. And I look forward to the support of all parliamentarians that we work together in passing this bill in a timely basis and that we can proceed to fight this enemy that's within our borders. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Remember, the question is that Parliament approves the declaration of state of emergency that was published in the Gazette on the third day of February 2021 as statutory instrument number 27 of 2021 contain a declaration that a public emergency has arisen as a result of the occurrence of 2019 NCOV, an infectious disease commonly known as COVID-19, for the for a further period of 90 days commencing from the 11th day of February 2021 and end, ending on the 16th of May, 2021. Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, we are in serious times, and I would expect that the entire country would be supportive, the entire country would be together, the entire country would understand that COVID was not created by the government, but COVID exists, and the entire country would be in a mood of give and take. The entire country, the people of the country, would decide, let us move together to solve the problem. So you ask yourself, Mr. Speaker, why is there so much division? Why are there so many personal attacks? Why at this time we have to be on our favorite television stations, speaking about who was the best minister of commerce? Why at this time? Why these attacks at this time, Mr. Speaker, when the people of the country are suffering? We sit here in our alternative reality, or we live in our alternative worlds, and the people of the country are the ones who are suffering. The policemen that we speak to, they are the ones who are worried when their colleagues test positive. The nurses and the doctors at the hospitals who are worried that they may get infected. The ambulance drivers, Mr. Speaker. The bus drivers are the ones. But what do we do? We stay in our tower and we attack personal. We attack the leader of the opposition. We say all kinds of things because we believe that we will gain political advantage. So why are we in this position today? Why are the people crying for help? Why in spite of what we say, the people are expressing dismay? The people are saying things are not how we think they are. We try the reflection, we try the flashing mirrors, we try to all kinds of things to deflect 
from the position that St. Lucia is in crisis. There are nearly 2,000 people who have been affected by COVID. And who wants COVID? Who wants a country to be affected by this plague, Mr. Speaker? Who wants it, Mr. Speaker? What do we do? We play politics. We accuse people for our surrogates of being sick, Mr. Speaker. And let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, for the benefit, the last time I had my medical check, I was very healthy. So I want to thank those of those who have expressed concerns of my health. The last time, I was very healthy. So, Mr. Speaker, where are we? We're in a position of lack of trust, where the people are asking, why a state of emergency for 90 days? You know why, Mr. Speaker? Because they do not trust the government. They do not believe that the government will stick to its word and the state of emergency will be only for COVID. They did not trust the government, Mr. Speaker. They did not trust the government. Mr. Speaker, the COVID situation is real. 19 people have died. And in some circles, they are calling people who die because of COVID. They say it's social murder. That's being said in some circles, Mr. Speaker. That people who die from COVID, it's social murder. 19 of our citizens have died. But do we, what do we do as a government? We take our time to attack personalities. And today in this house, I assure you, what you'll hear from the government side is attacks. Attacks on the opposition. Attacks on the member from Castries South. Attacks on the member from Castries East. Attacks, attacks, attacks. That's what you will hear. You will not hear a call for us to understand that we are in crisis. We will not hear a call that the state of emergency may be necessary because the country is in crisis, because there are nearly 2,000 of our fellow citizens who have been to have tested positive for COVID. And if you have to look at the situation statistically, Mr. Speaker, every batch of tests, every batch of tests, more than 20% of these tests, the people have returned positive results. And if you have extrapolated to the population, it is very reasonable to assume based on probability that if from the batch that you test, every batch, 20% are positive, the situation may be more serious than we think it is, Mr. Speaker. So when, while we debate that state of emergency, and other places we play politics, other places we get involved in the lowest and the, the most debased attacks on people, are we and our surrogates? Why is the government does that? The people are suffering. And the people will continue to suffer, and the people will continue not to trust the government because the government has proved that it can't be trusted, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when the situation of COVID was under control, the government boasted, how can you argue with success? They attacked the, the opposition. They said all sorts of things, Mr. Speaker. They even went as far, and up to last week, the surrogates were saying that an opposition march that caused us, caused us a spike in COVID. How can you expect a people to follow you? When you're in government, you have the responsibility. You are responsible, Mr. Speaker, but you spread this false conspiracy. It's very similar to what's happening in, in the US with Trump. You and your surrogates, you continue to push the false narrative. That's an opposition match, which is which that match was under the, we got permission from the medical authorities, Mr. Speaker. But you continue these false conspiracies because you want to gain political advantage. Well, you have absolutely no proof that the match caused a spike in COVID. But when the spike in COVID comes in January, you blame the people. Mr. Speaker, the state of emergency for 90 days will not help 
because the government's priorities are still wrong. The government as we speak, and I came to this honorable house and I said so, the government is spending $20 million on two and a half miles of road at Rodney Bay. $20 million done without tender priorities as we speak. What is the benefit of spending $20 million on the road now in times of COVID when the people of this country are telling you that their small businesses are in trouble? When the people of this country are telling you that their children, the education of their children is suffering because you don't have enough laptops. So what do you do? You are paying for stopping a laptop program, where the government has the report when the laptop program was first introduced, in the government's possession is a report that said that the majority of people that were consulted agreed with the project. But for political mileage, but in, because you want to Kill. Because you want to kill the legacy of the Labour Party, you stop the project. And then you rush now with e-books. I mean, because you know what I mean these e-books? They must pay a license every year for every e-book in the country. They must pay a license for the content. They must pay a license to an Indian firm, to a foreign Indian firm, every year. They must pay a license for the use of the content in the ebook every year. And I'm putting it to you, Mr. Speaker. If the government had continued with the laptop program in that state of emergency, our students would have been able to learn virtually and would have been able and their education. Because in spite of what we say, the education of the children of this country has suffered. It's part of all the flashing mirrors. And what do they do? Right now, they're distributing e-books e and tablets. But you don't know what they do with the tablets. They give it to the political people in the constituency to distribute it. And they allow the parliamentary reps with nothing. And you talk about getting together for COVID. You talk about getting together for COVID, Mr. Speaker. And you talk about a state of emergency will help. When the children that you have to educate. You give tablets only to your political people in the constituency. You have political people in the constituency who lost elections. They are the ones who are distributing tablets in the constituency, whereas the elected representatives of the people in the opposition are left without. And you speak about getting together and a state of emergency will help and a curfew will assist where that, that is happening. When we spoke the last time in this honorable house, our position was clear that we had reservations about the government and the state of emergency and the curfew. But we said, based on the science and the advice of professionals, we are going ahead, Mr. Speaker. But the government abused it. They did not change. Their modus of operandi did not change. They did not come to the people. They didn't come to the opposition. They did not show any equity. They did not show any good faith, Mr. Speaker. They continued, as we speak, up to yesterday, Mr. Speaker, they in the constituencies distributing tablets, up to yesterday. Even in the distrib this distribution of food, they did the same thing, up to today, up to this week, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you something. In the distribution, the opposition has not officially been given, and I want to make it clear, nobody has called the opposition and said to them, say to us, we, are in, we have distribution of masks, of sanitizing equipment, hey, hey, what you have for your constituency. I had to call the CMO myself. And to a credit, I got two or three boxes of masks. And you talk about doing things in a manner 
to show we in crisis, Mr. Speaker, and you think a state of emergency and a curfew will help you? Where is the goodwill? Where is the government showing that it really cares about the people and not the politics and not to score cheap political points and not to continue the charade that they, they, that they perform on television all the time? Where is the evidence, Mr. Speaker? So, Mr. Speaker, we are spending $20 million on two miles of road. $20 million on two miles of road. And you don't know what we'll do? We'll continue to attack. You didn't see that attack. Uh, you all uh, nonsense. And, and now you know that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, but the, the reality is the people of the country are suffering. And you can come here and you can heckle, you can live in your false paradise, but the people of the country are suffering. And when you go to speak to the people, they will tell you that they are suffering. The people. I don't speak for myself. When you attack me, the people have judged me. The people judge me all the time. And I'm proud of how the people have judged me. So when you attack me, you attack me, but the people, the people of the country that I speak for, they are the ones who judge me. And my fate in politics depends on the people. Not you. Mr. Mr. Speaker, in spite of what we say, we are in crisis. And the state of emergency will not help us unless, we change, unless the government changes its attitude and takes responsibility for what's happening in the country. Unless the government can man up and take responsibility and say, we made mistakes. We boasted prematurely. We called success too early. We said our tourism was being well managed too early. We did not wait. Unless the government can take that responsibility and stop the excuses and the attacks and the innuendos and the little bits of victimization and the vindictiveness, we'll get nowhere. As it, as it has shown over the last year, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, COVID was not created by, by the government? Of course not. Whoever said so? We came here, and I can document every time I spoke in this honorable house, both in the public and the private, I said to people, wear your masks, sanitize. In fact, they, came, they laughed at me for wearing masks. They laughed at me as a joke. You see? They laughed at me, Mr. Speaker. But you know, for them, it's a joke. You know why it's a joke, Mr. Speaker? Because they don't feel it. They don't understand it. They don't know what the people are going through. They are happy. They've stacked away their fortunes. So they don't care what the people are saying. They don't feel it. So they laugh. They make a joke about it. Because the people in the George Charles Boulevard now, who cannot wash their hands, because the government has refused to open a, a, a facility. And instead of that, they attack me. It's not the government, it's not about wash your hands and sanitize. The government has refused to open a facility for the people in the George Charles Boulevard, but they attack me instead. Why are you attacking me? When you, I, don't, I never ask you to use facility. But, but you attack me instead. Attack me, go ahead. I, call, I put myself in the hands of the people, continue to attack me. But the people, Mr. Speaker, so in the George Charles Boulevard, you speak about sanitation, you speak about washing the hands, and the people's facility remains closed. And you sit here and you attack me and you laugh. And you say, St. Lucia is doing well. You, you are the best manager, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the government continues to play politics with COVID. And the curfew will not help unless the government stops playing politics with COVID. Unless the government takes responsibility, Mr. Speaker. When the government boasted about they were the best and you can't argue with, with, with success, other countries, other countries were strengthening the protocols. Other countries were seeing how they could improve it, Mr. Speaker. And that is why in the small country of St. Kitts, the Prime Minister now can say that St. Kitts is a real model, is a real model for how to control COVID. In Grenada, in Dominica, Mr. Speaker, because they took their time. They did not try to score cheap political points. 
so early in the game, they measured. Mr. Speaker, they measured, Mr. Speaker. They measured, Mr. Speaker. And there can be, Mr. Speaker, and in spite of what they see, they boasted, and that, is, and that is why, Mr. Speaker, when I come to speak about the vaccination, I will say our position. Because, you see, Mr. Speaker, the government, Honorable members. the government, the, and you see, Mr. Speaker, what's happening here today can show you. Instead of the members sit and make and go into introspection and say, I may have gone wrong. It's not that, Mr. Speaker. What they do, Mr. Speaker, they continue to live in the Tower of Babel. You fault. You this, you that. But the reality is, Mr. Speaker, 2,000 people have contacted COVID and 20 have died. So you can sit and you can say whatever you want. That's, these are the facts, Mr. Speaker. And the facts are, in the hospital, you only have three or four ICQ beds, Mr. Speaker. And you, have, I, you only have three or four beds at the ICU. My apologies, I can make mistakes. So why are you laughing? You're making a big fuss at that. That's your problem. Petty things, pettiness, nonsense. You only have, and you have 10 ventilators in boxes that you haven't opened. These, these are the facts. These are the facts, Mr. Speaker. You have 10 ventilators in the boxes that you haven't opened. 10. These are the facts, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, you can come. I am not the one, Mr. Speaker. So I let them to attack me. The more they attack me, the more the people suffer. Because when they attack me, they think they are doing me something. I have said before, Mr. Speaker, that the people have judged me. And the people will judge me again. The people have judged me. So I, so, so I laugh at the attacks on me. Go and tell the people that. Go and speak to the people, Mr. Speaker. As you speak, Mr. Speaker, the government has, is, the government has a list of essential services. The government has a list of essential services, Mr. Speaker. And again, Mr. Speaker, in these essential services, the people are suffering. Because the people are saying, some of our stores where we got things at a moderate price are closed. You understand? Some of the stores. And it, as you speak, and it's not me, I speak on behalf of what the people are saying. The people are saying that SMS is closed. And there's a petition now asking to open SNS, Mr. Speaker, because the people are saying that. Because the government must understand that they can remain in their elevated towers. But, Mr. Speaker. Uh, honorable members. No, Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you something. I have come here all the time before. I have to divert a little bit. And I've said to them, they can say whatever they want. The people will judge them. And that is why they're scrambling now, you know. That's why they're spending $20 million on two miles of road. That's, when they, 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 that's why they, they damaged, they bulldozed two buildings at St. Jude. And now they're rushing, having visits to say, oh, we're in hospital. That's why. Because the four years is over. The time is over. And that is why you see they're scrambling. And they are so desperate. Because the time is over, Mr. Speaker. The time. The time has come. So desperation has set in. So you see them saying more and tapping more phones and doing more things now because time is here. The time. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, I will always stand on the side of the people. Mr. Speaker, the government doesn't take our advice, Mr. Speaker. We said to the government, when you're speaking about essentials, look at what the people... And I want to give them... They, they do not take any advice. We want to say to them that people who are using the computers and tablets, they need these repairs. So find a way to, if they can ensure that computer repair shops get open and the protocols are observed. Just a bit of advice, which I know they will not take, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, people are skeptical about the government's motives because the government hasn't showed good intentions. Mr. Speaker, the vaccination, as we speak, the governments of Barbados and Dominica, Mr. Speaker, are getting vaccination, those from India, as we speak. But if I, you know, Mr. Speaker, there has been a lot of discussion 
about vaccination. But the government's own actions may cause people, and I was happy when the Prime Minister said, I was glad that he said so. But if the Prime Minister would only listen to what his members see, what his surrogates see, he might, he might have adjusted some of what he says. The Prime Minister says, there are still some people who doubt COVID. But you know what the member this morning just said? Albeit in another side, our match caused COVID, caused COVID spike. Absolutely no scientific inf information, but they say it for political reasons. So when you send these double messages, when on one hand you tell people obey the science, when on one hand you tell people to curfew, when on one hand you tell people these things, and on the other hand you speak about useless conspiracies, Mr. Speaker, you are not helping your cause. And that is why the average solution does not trust the government. That is why. That is why the average person in this country finds it so difficult to listen to what the government is saying. That is why, Mr. Speaker. So if you ask the average solution, do you really believe the government? Do you think that there is good faith in the government when the government wants to set up a state of emergency? Do you really believe it is because you want to control COVID only? If you ask the average solution, Mr. Speaker, no, you know what that he'll tell you? I'm really skeptical. I don't believe. I believe that the government wants to campaign quietly. I believe that the government wants to do these things because an election is, is, is a, That's what the average solution will tell you, Mr. Speaker. And while you continue to do that, instead of you deal with that perception, instead of you deal with that perception, Mr. Speaker, you think you can attack the opposition. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the opposition is not in power. The government does not include the opposition in any serious discussion on anything. What the, gov the government, Mr. Speaker, the government, the government tries to use the opposition when they are under pressure. I'll tell you how, what, how the, what happens if a government will consult the opposition in serious matters. You know what the government should do? In if the government was very serious about consulting the opposition, the government would say, hey, look, we have one million dollars available for working the constituency. One million dollars available. There are 17 constituencies. Opposition, what would you like for your constituency? That's serious consultation. And then we, we could decide and have, have, have a discussion. But no, no, no. What they will do, they will try and they laugh. And they just laugh. <laughs> Laughing. You know why he's laughing, Mr. Speaker? Because the truth, it has hit home. So he has to hide his shame in laughing. Mr. Speaker, these are, that's what you hear. That's all what you hear. But the people of St. Lucia decided that was wrong. And they voted you to change it. The people of the country decided that was wrong. And they voted you to change it. So it's your opportunity. You are the one in government. You must change it. Not me. I can't change it. Mr. Speaker, that is what, Mr. Speaker, the people, the people are the ones, not me, Mr. Speaker. So I'm saying to the government, if they're serious, they must have a serious program, a serious economic sustainability program of $120 million in the next year for the people of the country. That is what we are recommending. Not hide it on roads that you build without, by direct award. Not hide it there. Hide it in serious people programs. If you're serious about it. And let us discuss these people programs. And let's discuss the programs with, in a meaningful way with the opposition if you're serious about it. So you say the stimulus you have, how much you have to spend, and let us speak about how we are using it. Don't hide it and play with it. No, that is what is serious about government consultation and government dealing with a crisis, with a COVID crisis, Mr. Speaker. This is what is serious, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm saying to you, Mr. Speaker, that the government must understand that the poor and vulnerable in this country are suffering. The poor and vulnerable in this country are suffering. There are thousands of students who do not have tablets, who do not have internet access, that their education is suffering. 
suffering, Mr. Speaker. So don't attack me for that. Mr. Speaker, don't attack me for that. I'm on the cause. I left you with one laptop per student project. Don't attack me for that. Why me? Why members of your position? All we are saying to you is the reality of the situation is that while you continue to give tablets to your political people, to give to their friends, hundreds of children have no tablets and hundreds of children cannot continue their education. That's what we say. And this is serious. So don't attack me. Don't attack me. I'm not the one complaining about it. I'm not the one complaining about it, you know. It's the people who are complaining, not me. So when you attack me and the members opposite, you're attacking the, not us. We are voices of the people who are complaining, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the government blames everyone for causing the, the, the outbreak. They blame the opposition. They blame the people from Matnik. They blame Backdoor. They blame fishermen. They blame, they blame, they blame. The only thing that they have not blamed, Mr. Speaker, they have not taken responsibility for the failures of the approach. They have not taken responsibility, Mr. Speaker. And they refuse to take responsibility, Mr. Speaker. They refuse to take it, Mr. Speaker. Because you know why? They believe that when you create the flashing mirrors and attack the opposition and give a little hand out here and there and call somebody and give them something, that that will help them for political success. The people, the people, the people, they are past that. And the nurses are complaining. All the eight they are afraid of, of, of the victimization and the vindictiveness. But quietly, they complain. The police quietly are complaining, Mr. Speaker. They are complaining quietly. And you blame us. And you blame the opposition. Blame us for that. Blame us for the fact that policemen in a particular unit tested positive for COVID and they are complaining. Blame us for that. Blame us. Continue to blame us. Continue to blame us for the fact that the nurses are concerned that they may be they, they may have contagion at the hospitals. Blame us. Blame us for that. Continue to blame us. We can take the blame. But the people, they are the ones you must deal with, not us. Continue to blame, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I, Mr. Speaker, I want to say to the government that in spite of the state of emergency and the curfew, they must, there are other steps that they must take, Mr. Speaker. First of all, they must try to get the people of the country to trust them. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, they must stop speaking in different tongues. That's what they do. They come here and they say something and they go on their favorite television station and, say, and speak about things that are incomprehensible. Things that you wonder, are these guys serious? Are these guys living in a time of crisis when the whole country should be, should be focused on dealing with the COVID situation? You speak about who was a better minister of commerce. At this time, when people, when you sit in a, when people are speaking about serious things, you sit in, you sit in a television studio and talk about people's color. At this time, when people are talking seriously, you sit in a television studio and you do not speak and you do not tell people, you do not tell people desist from these things. In a time of COVID, when 20 people have died, more people have died in St. Lucia from COVID than in, than in the OECS and Barbados. This is the situation. This is the reality. So attack me. Continue to attack me. That is the reality, Mr. Speaker. That's reality. And you continue to say, and you continue to say, and you believe you can shout and fool people with that. And because you can deal with, you can go and talk and play, play facts. The reality is, the people listen. The people know what you say, Mr. Speaker. The people listen. And the people are afraid because the people know that at the, at the hospitals, if there is a real outbreak where people need critical care, we are in trouble. And that is the reality. So the curfew will not help us, Mr. Speaker, unless you put these things in place. And everybody knows it. But you know, Mr. Speaker, for political gain, 
will come in today and will grant charge, will attack me. That's what they'll do, attack me. Or attack members of the opposition. But we are accustomed to Mr. We are accustomed to Mr. Speaker. But they laugh. They laugh. It's a joke. 20 people have died, but you're laughing. 20 people have died. More people have died in St. Lucia than in the OECS, but you're laughing. It's a joke. It's a joke, Mr. Speaker. It's a joke. Laugh. Laugh, Mr. Speaker. Laugh, Mr. Speaker. Laugh, Mr. Laugh. Mr. Speaker, I want to say to the government, I want to recommend to the government that they dramatically increase testing and tracing technologies to fully access the extent of the spread and, combat the and to combat the virus. I want to say to them to try to see if the testing results can come quicker so people can have better ideas, a better idea of what's happening. Because there are stories, and there are real stories of, out there, real stories of people who tested and did not get the results in 10 days. Real stories. People's stories, not my stories, not people's stories, Mr. Speaker. I want to say to the government, Mr. Speaker, to implement new stringent, um, new stringent protocols for travel and tourism to ensure safety of St. Lucians and to control visitor to local transmission. Even though you do it already, try to improve it, Mr. Speaker. I want to say to the government, Mr. Speaker, to increase the number of beds and staff to ensure that everyone receives quality care and can isolate safely and comfortably. I want to say to the government, Mr. Speaker, that if they really believe that they ought to be, based on the science, a shutdown of the country, have it in a short, a hard shutdown, shutdown but ensure that the people have the adequate and the necessary support so they can enjoy it, Mr. Speaker. Do not just shut it down and have the people suffering. Ensure that you can enjoy it, that the people can enjoy it, Mr. Speaker. So in your shutdown, ensure that the people have adequate support. I want to say to the government, Mr. Speaker, to equip, to equip as many students as possible with tablets and devices, Mr. Speaker, so their learning cannot be jeopardize. I want to say to the government, Mr. Speaker, when the vaccination to try to go to other sources, try to seek help in the vaccination process from other sources, Mr. Speaker, and have a mass education because by their own utterances, like saying that the match caused COVID, this, by their own utterances, they are putting doubt in the science. By their own political utterances, they are putting doubt in the science, Mr. Speaker, by their own utterances, Mr. Speaker. So I'm saying to them, try, Mr. Speaker, try in the vaccination program to be equitable, to be fair, and to have education, mass education, Mr. Speaker. And finally, I'm saying to them, Mr. Speaker, have a real economic and social stimulus. Have a real stimulus, don't mass it. Direct interventions in what the people want, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the government is embarking on a 90 day state of emergency. We are saying to the government, why not 21 days in the first instance, 7 and 21, that'll be 30, and then return at some other point? Why don't we have seven of us gone and have another 21 day SOE or, or SOE for 21 days? Why? Why 90 days? If the government wants to have meetings of parliament, they can do it. They can do it, Mr. Speaker. We, we, we will oblige. So why 90 days? What's the magic about 90 days? If you want to have a hard shutdown, why are the state emergency for 90 days? Why? Mr. Speaker. The people are not trusting the government. The people are saying, and that may be what the people think, that the government intends to slide in general elections in that 90-day period, or soon after. The people are saying that, Mr. Speaker. And if you look at what they're doing now, look what they're doing now. The people, don't, the people are not saying it because they have no reason to say it to Mr. Speaker. They're, they're all along offering people contracts. 
They are offering people this and that. Offering people building material. All kinds of things now. They are offering all kinds of things now, Mr. Speaker. And they think that the people they offer it will, will not take it. Of course the people will take it. They all, all over Mr. Speaker, doing this thing. And they want to slide and hide. That's what the people are saying. That they want to hide on it, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, we are saying, Mr. Speaker, that the government, the government has failed in its management of COVID. The government has failed because the government, they boasted too early. The government has failed because the government has not adequately involved the opposition in the discussions on the mitigation for COVID. The government has failed because the government has continued to be involved in petty personal politics instead of dealing with the issues and as they relate to COVID in the country. The government has failed because it has, it has dropped the ball on the medical facilities by keeping St. Jude in that situation up to now and rushing now to try to do something there because elections are coming. The government has failed because they've tried their best to try to kill the legacy of the Labour Party for a political gain. Not remembering, Mr. Speaker, that COVID is real. Finally, Mr. Speaker, I want to tell the people of St. Lucia that they must understand that the country is in crisis. I want to tell them, obey the protocols. Make the necessary sacrifices. Our opposition has been consistent, Mr. Speaker. We've always said, wear your mask, sanitize, and remain socially distant. But we've always said so, Mr. Speaker, and we stand firm in that conviction that the people of St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, will understand that political gimmicks, vindictiveness, and victimization will not survive and the time will come when the people will express the people will put a government in place that will really deal with the issues as they relate to COVID. It's not about me Mr. Speaker. It's about the people of the country. So whereas you continue, you and your surrogates, you continue to believe that you can gain political points by attacking me and the other members of the opposition the country is suffering the country is suffering. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Social Sanctuaries. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think it's still early days in the year for me to wish all my colleagues the very best in 2021, despite the challenges that we have facing us, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there is a saying that loud does not always mean you're strong, and quiet does not always mean that you're weak. And I suspect maybe because of me being a little quiet most of the time that the leader of the opposition, and probably because I was in his, at his back, he decided to take issue with me as the Minister of Commerce whether or not I was the best Minister of Commerce compared to other Ministers of Commerce. Minister, I will, um, Mr. Speaker, I will not go into any 
debate as to who is the best minister of commerce. Um, that is always something that the people will respond to. But what I do know, Mr. Speaker, is that only two years within becoming a minister of commerce, I recognize that it was not all about tourism and agriculture, but that there were hundreds of small businesses who never had the opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to get any sort of concessionary assistance from the government. And it came into this House in September 2019 to pass legislation to benefit hundreds, hundreds of small businesses, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as Caribbean people, we are known to be very sociable people. So, Mr. Speaker, me, like thousands, for the most part, of Caribbean people, St. Lucian people, we're tired of wearing a mask. We're tired of wearing a mask, Mr. Speaker. We're tired of staying indoors. Mr. Speaker, we're tired of not being able to take a line. We're tired of not being able to socialize in the cab away with all walks of life, Mr. Speaker. We're tired of not being able to go to church. We're tired of not being able to go to the river, not being able to go to the waterfalls. For those of us who have that in our community. We're tired, Mr. Speaker, that we could not have continued our successful cricket match in Chozel under the lights that were installed under this administration, Mr. Speaker. We're tired of the fact, Mr. Speaker, that we cannot have the football competition that draws crowds and bring our young people together, Mr. Speaker. We're very tired, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and with that tiredness comes a level of frustration and some pain, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, it is a pain, it is a pain, Mr. Speaker, that I choose to accept, Mr. Speaker. As a responsible son, as a responsible father, as a responsible parliamentary representative, as a responsible minister, and as a responsible citizen, minister, Mr. Speaker, it is a pain that I'm willing to accept for as long as it's going to take, Mr. Speaker, to address the predicament that we're in currently, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, while the science indicates that there is an upper 95% survival rate from the COVID-19, the small difference is what concerns me, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, COVID has no friends. No friends. COVID, don't mind, don't, it doesn't matter what your color is, Mr. Speaker. It does not matter what your network is, Mr. Speaker. And we have seen it, Mr. Speaker. COVID has no friends, Mr. Speaker. The small difference, Mr. Speaker, that will die is what concerns me, Mr. Speaker. We have today recorded 19 I heard the Prime Minister indicate 20, so there must be a new, a new death, Mr. Speaker. And every time we hear of a death, Mr. Mr. Speaker, it brings sorrow, Mr. Speaker, because I recognize the pain to several families as it relates to losing a loved one. And so, Mr. Speaker, I support the state of emergency that the Prime Minister speaks to this morning. And Mr. Speaker, when we issue these regulations and these guidelines, it's because we are guided by the technocrats, the people who know what is going on on the ground. We are guided by the CMO and the Common Center, and as a cabinet, a decision is made which is brought to Parliament, Mr. Speaker. And so, Mr. Speaker, we have been advised that we must limit socialization. And when the contact tracing is done when they rewind the places that people have been who have tested positive. Most times it leads back to some sort of socialization, Mr. Speaker. And so, Mr. Speaker, as a responsible government, the responsible thing that had to be done was how can we curb that socialization? As much as we know that it's a painful thing for the wider society, but there are times, Mr. Speaker, you have to take and make some painful decisions for the benefit of the majority. 
More so, Mr. Speaker, as long as we continue to be under the COVID attack, Mr. Speaker, the more the country's finances are affected. We have heard, and I heard from the, 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 the leader of the opposition this morning, suggesting or speaking as to whether the government should also consider a total shutdown, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to remind all those calling for a total shutdown, Mr. Speaker, that the private sector, the private sector is what is responsible for paying government taxes. And these taxes in turn, Mr. Speaker, is what government uses to pay their obligations. Mr. Speaker, we've heard it time and time again on previous parliamentary sittings where the opposition suggests that COVID has exposed the malhandling of government finances. We've heard it. And Mr. Speaker, I want to say today that that is being mischievous, Mr. Speaker. Being mischievous. And we heard the leader of the opposition speak and he spoke and his words exactly was, why do people are saying things are not the way they say it is? And why do people do not trust the government? But Mr. Speaker, when as an opposition, you represent a significant portion of the population, and you would come in this honorable house, and you would insinuate, Mr. Speaker, that COVID has exposed the malhandling of government finances, when you know as an opposition, Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure you also are very aware that the way government operates is that revenue received is what will determine what you can pay out, Mr. Speaker. And when you come creating such mischief, Mr. Speaker, it cannot serve the citizens of this country well. And it cannot serve the opposition well if they continue to abuse that sort of language, Mr. Speaker, if their intent is to get into government. Because these statements come back and haunt you. And so we have to be responsible in making certain statements because these statements are what creates various divisions and various mis mis mistrust, Mr. Speaker. We have to be very responsible in what we say, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is recommended from a private perspective that you should always have a minimum of about six months savings in the event you should lose your job. Six months savings so that you can continue to live on while in search of another job. Mr. Speaker, government has no savings. Government has no savings, Mr. Speaker. Government has no savings account. But for some reason, there is a, 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 a false impression that government has a savings account that they can always go into, Mr. Speaker. Government has always depended on what they receive to what, in terms of what they pay out, Mr. Speaker. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the difference between this government and the opposition is the gov this government has always sought to create a sinking fund. Always sought to create a sinking fund, Mr. Speaker, so that for days like... What we're experiencing now, there's a buffer that we could have dipped into. But you know what, Mr. Speaker? You know what, Mr. Speaker? Whenever the opposition comes into office, the first place they go to is in that sinking fund. The facts are there. The facts are there, Mr. Speaker. The sinking fund, Mr. Speaker, you're expected. Honorable members. Honorable members. Mr. Speaker, most of government revenue comes from the collection of taxes, as I said. And the two, two biggest contributors of government taxes, inland revenue and customs. Two biggest revenue earners, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, the figures that we are seeing reflect year over year, because of COVID, a minimum of 36% drop in revenue. 36%, Mr. Speaker. That's no small figure, you know, Mr. Speaker. But you know what, Mr. Speaker? Where this government must be commended 
We have never failed to pay the civil service, Mr. Speaker. We have never failed, Mr. Speaker, to pay rental obligations. Never paid to pay our pensions. Never failed to pay our gratuities, Mr. Speaker. And you know how, Mr. Speaker? Because this government has successfully been able to negotiate increase overdrafts. We've been able to increase our overdraft with the ECCB, been able to increase our overdraft with the various local banks, and we've all also been able, and thanks to the, to the technocrats at the Ministry of Finance too, we've also been able to successfully negotiate several loan, loans at incredible rates and, and, and terms, Mr. Speaker. And the only reason we can negotiate such is because of confidence in the government, Mr. Speaker. So we have gotten loans, Mr. Speaker, where we don't have to start paying back in 10 years. 10 years. Where the interest rate is extremely low, Mr. Speaker. But you know the mischief where it continues, Mr. Speaker? The opposition wants to compare St. Lucia as the biggest economy in the OECS with 185,000 people, right. according to the UN data, to Antigua, St. Kitts, Dominica, St. Vincent, Grenada, Mr. Speaker, St. Kitts has a population of 35,000 people. Antigua, 110. St. Vincent, 110. Similar. Dominica, 80-something thousand, Mr. Speaker. We have 185,000 people. Barbados, Barbados have uh, just under 200,000. Do, you know do you know what's going on in Barbados right now, Mr. Speaker? Do you know what's going on in Barbados right now? Barbados is speaking currently of, of, of a further shutdown, 15 days. Yes, extending it, I'm talking about. Extending it for another... Um, so, Mr. Speaker, you cannot compare apples and oranges. You cannot compare apples and oranges. You cannot compare us to St. Kitts. 35,000 people, and you want to compare that St. Kitts has been able to do such. We are the largest economy in the OECS, Mr. Speaker. So we must stop spelling, spreading these falsehoods, Mr. Speaker. That creating the mistrust. But you know what, Mr. Speaker? What is important in this environment is that People no longer just listen. People can go online and get the information for themselves. People don't just swallow things wholesale anymore, Mr. Speaker. No longer, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, further to all of these expenses that the government has continued to pay or to continue to, to, to successfully um, uh, um, address, Mr. Speaker, the additional cost but about by COVID has been astronomical, Mr. Speaker. Astronomical. When we were moving from VH to OKU, Mr. Speaker, VH has now become another entity in itself, an expensive entity, Mr. Speaker. Some time ago, I was listening to the, the, the cost of an oxygen tank, Mr. Speaker. One oxygen tank cost about $200. $200, and for a day, People use three, four of that. One person uses three or four of that, Mr. Speaker. Multiply that by the number of people at, at, at currently at VH. This is the kind of cost that this government has to bear every day, Mr. Speaker. As of yesterday, the government had already done 26,000 tests. There's a cost to that, Mr. Speaker. There's a cost to that. And you speak about government not recognizing the people who are vulnerable. Government has made available packages to thousands of people. Right. Single mothers have benefited. Thousands of single mothers have benefited, Mr. Speaker. Across the island. And you say the government is not looking at after the, the, the vulnerable. Mr. Speaker, this government continues, Mr. Speaker, to recognize the challenges we have as a government. And the opposition continues to say, why don't we take some of the monies that we have gotten as loans for various projects and just give it to people? And then what happens after that? You stand with, like they say, De la at the end of the day, you have nothing, nothing to show. Mr. Speaker, the same $20 million that you're speaking about, roadworks, Mr. Speaker, you know how many people are employed? How many people are employed making a living, Mr. Speaker? The roads, the airports, 
the water facilities in Beaufort, Mr. Speaker. Thousands of people, Mr. Speaker. And these people bring revenue to their homes, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, we have a crisis on our hands. I know there's a concern by many people as it relates to the, the, the state of emergency being announced as 90 days. But as the Prime Minister indicated, Mr. Speaker, 90 days is something that can always be changed at any point in time. It's just by a declaration from the Governor General. It avoids us having to come back continuously to Parliament to extend based on reports from the Command Centre. And Mr. Speaker, tomorrow, being the, the 10th, where some of these regulations have come to an end, based on guidelines that we will be receiving from the Command Centre, some of these guidance, um, guidelines will change. They will change, Mr. Speaker, because we are guided by the facts. It's just not on, on a whim and fancy that we make certain decisions. So when we, 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 we study what is presented to us, Mr. Speaker, as a cabinet, we decide, we, we make a decision going forward. So, Mr. Speaker, this government takes very, very seriously the issue of trying to curb the COVID spread. And I want, Mr. Speaker, as I have been doing for over a year now, to urge the citizens of St. Lucia, and in particular, the citizens and my constituents of Shosal Saldivas, to please follow the protocols. Please wear your mask. Please sanitize often. Please maintain the social distancing. Yes, we are social people. We miss hugging. We miss being with each other. But we have to enjoy that pain for the better good. The faster we can get out of that, the better for all of us. So let us just exercise some patience. As I said, Mr. Speaker, it is difficult. It is difficult. But there is a better good in it, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the Prime Minister for continuously looking after the benefit of the citizens of this country. I want to thank the members of my cabinet for the continued guidance and for our continued um, cooperation. Sometimes we have very, very strong um, opinions, Mr. Speaker, but at, at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, the decision that we make is for the betterment of the country. I thank you very much. Member for Castro South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my colleagues before me, it's our first meeting for the new year. So I want to extend best wishes despite the challenges that we face as a nation and as a parliament. Mr. Speaker, what are we asked to approve here today? We are asked to approve a resolution extending the state of emergency for another 90 days. The consequence of which is to provide the Prime Minister with exceptional powers which can be abused. It means the Prime Minister has extrajudicial powers which can be exercised 
to suspend fundamental civil rights and other freedoms. It is such a powerful transfer of power to the Prime Minister that the Constitution requires that after the Governor General proclaims a state of emergency, the government has seven days to come to Parliament to approve its extension or its end. It is not an act that any democratic society readily does or even must ever do, and certainly not to a prime minister like ours who cannot be trusted. Worse, we are asked to give this power to the prime minister for 90 days. I repeat, for 90 days. Our position on a, st on a state of emergency is very clear. It was stated on the 24th of March 2020 in this honorable chamber. We are opposed, we are opposed to a state of emergency. We believe that all the necessary action that needs to be taken to protect lives can be done under existing laws. The leader of the opposition said it then, and here is what I said on that occasion, and I quote, the most important point for me, Mr. Speaker, is that we have said, and the leader of the opposition said it, that there is a strong body of opinion that we do not need a state of emergency, that every power in the orders can be found under the Public Health Act and under the Quarantine Act including the notion of restricting movements of people. And I went on. But the government decides it wants a state of emergency. Again, like we said, we are giving the government all the space to do what is necessary. That is what we said in March 2020. In September 2020, this Honorable House passed the COVID-19 Prevention and Control Bill. We were told then by the government that the bill would contain every requirement needed to control the COVID virus. We were told that it was merely bringing together the things we were doing under the state of emergency. Every requirement was there. That's what we were told. The COVID bill was opposed by us and many other stakeholders not because of the protocols in the bill, which we generally supported, but we, like other stakeholders, felt rightfully that there had not been sufficient consultation on all of its provisions, and that some of the provisions were a violation of our civic liberties and rights of citizens, and we maintain that the protocols could stand alone. The government argued that it was necessary, it was holistic. Yet today, we are asked to approve the extension of a state of emergency because it is necessary for the prevention and control of COVID-19. But why is a state of emergency necessary? Why do we have to give someone, this Prime Minister, the ability to suspend our civil rights and liberties without consulting us. We have not been told why. Nowhere in his explanations has the Prime Minister outlined a reasonable, let alone sensible, case for the state of emergency to replace the COVID Act, which we were told had everything needed to prevent and control COVID-19. The Prime Minister says he needs a state of emergency because a curfew is needed. Do we even need a curfew? Do we? So let's examine what confronts us right now in St. Lucia. Truth is, quite simply, we are facing a crisis. A crisis of unspeakable volumes. After one year, the Prime Minister will still say, we are still learning how to deal with the pandemic while ignoring common sense, the science, the simple things being done by the international community. Just look at the statistics. 
On December 18, 2020, we had 20 active cases. December 18, 2020, we had about 20 active cases. On February 7, two days ago, that number was 1,097. Over 50-fold increase in as many days. We started off the year with 153 reported cases. As of now, that number has increased sixfold, and we have now passed 2,000 total cases, and sadly, at least 19 unnecessary deaths. And I heard the Prime Minister said this morning that we've only had 1,810 cases. And I wondered whether or not his speech was written quite a few weeks, quite a few days ago. Those deaths and those cases could simply have been avoided if the Prime Minister and his ministers had put people first. If they had put people first and people's lives first. To paraphrase the Prime Minister, we sadly now have the highest per capita of GDP of COVID cases. To put this in perspective, we have the highest number of cases and most deaths in the Eastern Caribbean. And the member from Saltibus Rosel said about not comparing with Dominica, Antigua, St. Kitts, and not even comparing with Barbados. And I wonder who should we compare with. But let's put it in perspective where St. Lucia is. Barbados, with 50% larger population than us, has less cases and deaths. And they had a number of super spreader events. Barbados has done over 100,000 tests. We have done about 26,000. Barbados has tested for almost 40% of its population. We've tested about 14%. But St. Lucians, I am sure you all remember the chest beating and the boasting in this chamber that we are number one in the Caribbean and among the best in the world. Every single one of the parliamentarians opposite, from Grosili, Castries, Ancillary, Tannery, Soufre, Sozel, Miku, Denry, were bragging and boasting shamelessly. Shamelessly, that they boasted that this is the face of success and they are the best in the Caribbean. I remember saying to them then that a basketball game has four quarters, a soccer match has two halves, and you must never celebrate unnecessarily. More so, this is a public health issue, and no country should rejoice about being better than another country when it comes to a pandemic. They laughed at us. They would not listen. In October 2020, we had about 27 cases. They opened the borders to tourists from the UK and the US when they were experiencing a new wave of COVID cases. Madness, the people said. And caring, we in the Labour Party cried. They would not listen. They would boast and they would brag. We begged for more restrictions on those visitors and especially asked to implement a second test. Do you know why we asked it? We had just heard what Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, said of the impact of second testing. That 95% of second testers were positive. They laughed and boasted of high tourist arrival figures. And then it hit us. Bam! A spike. The government response was to shamelessly blame what they call a backdoor. St. Lucians entering illegally from Martinique. They even identify a bus driver and stigmatize and vilified him. And then they turned on SLP supporters. And you hear it repeated here today. Saying that it was the SLP protest match that was a super spreader event causing the spike. Yet no one positive test was linked to the match.
Not one. Even the CMO was moved to say that there was no evidence, no evidence that any backdoor entry was responsible for the spike. On December 14, 2020, Mr. Speaker, whilst we sat in this chamber, the UK authorities announced, that the detect announced the detection of a new variant and that it was more contagious and more deadly. Hear me, more contagious and more deadly. On 14th December, whilst we were in this chamber, and the government continued to boast and boast of tourist arrivals, including from the UK. Little did we know that 12 days later, we'd have the first recorded UK variant in St. Lucia. But they persisted that it was backdoor and the SLP match. But St. Lucians in all walks of life, in all the corridors, the street corners, were whispering that it was the front door causing the problem. But the government boast and boast that it was the back door and the SLP match. Everyone knows that the festive season is a time of merriment. It is what we call tradition Noel. It is a time when people gather and interact. But it is also a time when visitors come to this country, including from the UK where the new variant was wrecking havoc. By January 2021, the cases are exploding in St. Lucia. Almost 900 cases in January alone. There were countless cases in hotels. The government refused to condemn the violations of its own protocols by some hotels, and the spread continued. Not even in the face of, significant, of a significant number of cases would the government act. Then a new narrative emerged. St. Lucians are to be blamed for not staying home during the festive season. St. Lucians are indisciplined and must be blamed because St. Lucians are indisciplined, they are brain jackasses, barking dogs, after the 43%, they're indisciplined, they are mendicants, and they are the ones who be played. If only they had stayed home. But meanwhile, the elite is playing golf every weekend, mixing and continuing the merriment. And the government continues to boast of tourism arrivals and high occupancy rates. Whilst the people were continuing to be infected and becoming sick, and some started to die. And still the government boasted of tourism arrival figures. So how did we reach here, Mr. Speaker? We are here because this government failed the people of St. Lucia. This government failed to institute proper quarantine and in-country testing requirements for persons coming in from high-risk countries, including visitors and non-nationals. The vast majority of people entering our island never got retested, and visitors were always, almost never placed in any true quarantine. This government failed when we should have kept measures tight for the Christmas season. When there were rising numbers in the US, the UK, and Canada, the government said, everything was under control. We relaxed measures and the economy took priority because they wanted to boast of tourism arrival figures. The government failed to be cautious and take action, banning travel from the United Kingdom to guard against the new UK variant, which was up to 70% more infectious and potentially more deadly. This government failed to take action against hotels, even as the Prime Minister has admitted openly and after the fact, they knew that there were major breaches in major hotels. And even when a hotel had over 60 cases and a death, the government narrative was still that COVID was not being spread from guests 
to staff. And even after all these events, even, if, even after they we were told by authorities that they expected a spike in the month of January, we saw no pre-planning, no quick action. In fact, we saw the reverse. We saw the opening of school in the midst of a spike, only to shut the, down the week after. We saw three weeks pass before any action. While the spike continued, the cases increased, and people started to die. And even when they finally announced new measures, they were insufficient, as nearly every sector has been deemed essential. This government failed to ensure that even when the Labour Party persisted in its call for enhancing testing facilities to ensure that we can have an effective testing and tracing program, they failed to approve the rapid test when, on, when the WHO on September 11th published guidance on the use and highlighted the value of those tests in areas where community transmission is widespread. We were told in this house by a member that we were only saying that because there's a business in testing and some people want to make our money. And then the backlog of cases has overwhelmed the testing system. Contact tracing has become restricted to only the closest of contacts. Mr. Speaker, I know the case of a young man who in his workplace, there's somebody tested positive, and he was told he doesn't really have to test because he had his mask, and the, num the numbers are so overwhelming. And then his partner at work started to feel chills, and she said it was the AC. And then she was persuaded to go and get a test. And then she gets a test, and she's positive. And then her partner is also positive. They wait 12 days, 12 days before they get their results to say that they are positive. 12 days. They will not even call and contact trace to have to go on. They took their own, on their own, a decision to go and get tested and had to wait 12 days, Mr. Speaker. Think about this. And then the Prime Minister says this morning that the system is not overwhelmed. It is not overwhelmed. Hundreds of people are waiting up to two weeks to get their results. This government failed the people of St. Lucia because they did not provide sufficient quarantine and isolation facilities. Again, even when the Labour Party was crying out for monies to be used on COVID-related matters and not election projects, we were told that there was more than enough quarantine facilities with hotels being available, only to learn that these hotels were no longer available and instead they were preparing to receive visitors. It was an indictment on this government that so much money was borrowed, yet no independent state-owned property was retrofitted to quarantine persons awaiting results. Home quarantine has proven to be a disaster the use of watch and monitors took months to become a reality and now is not enough and does not really work. One year later, we cannot have a contact tracing app to assist the authorities. Our isolation facility is woefully inadequate despite all the painting of the outside. This government, when I raise the issue of the respiratory hospital, were laughing and boasting it's the most beautiful it has ever been in its history. And Mr. Speaker, you had to wonder. They totally ignored that the most important thing is not the look, not the bluff and the fluff, but the capacity of the facility. Today, the respiratory hospital is overwhelmed. The secondary facility is also overwhelmed. And home isolation is a disaster with over a thousand cases. And I'll give another story. Said I always have stories. Of a family, a gentleman who family called me. He went to OKEU to do an operation. Found out that he was positive. And in, 
is convinced he got it at OKEO. And only this morning in Barbados, it was announced how many persons at Queen Elizabeth Hospital, patients and staff, tested positive. In St. Lucia, you never heard those stories. But they are real out there, whispered in the corridors. The gentleman tested positive. The hospital discharged him to go home. An elderly sick man, he's taken to his home against the family wishes, left there. The family had to make calls and finally he's taken to a certain guest house. The treatment there is poor, Mr. Speaker. But this is what passes for isolation for citizens in Russia. Or some people stay home. They are positive and they stay home. This government failed the people of St. Lucia when it still cannot give a proper national vaccination program that goes beyond the provision of vaccines provided for the WHO and the COVAX arrangement. And the Prime Minister made mention of it, that they have vaccines for 20% of the population. But how will the rest of the population be vaccinated? Have they told you, the people of St. Lucia? Why can't the monies that were borrowed by this government be used to buy vaccines? The Labour Party has said, the political leader has said in his seven-point plan that we would use our diplomatic contacts and sources to get vaccines. And the political leader, the leader of the opposition mentioned this morning, and T um, Dominica and Barbados will be receiving additional vaccines from India. What has our government? What has our government been doing? What has our government been doing? Tell the people of St. Lucia how the other 80 percent will be vaccinated. The 20 percent is through no exceptional effort of this government. This is part of a global arrangement. So in effect, this government has made no arrangement anywhere in the world for us to get any vaccines. That's the reality. They failed the people of St. Lucia. The gov this government has failed when it decided to use monies borrowed from the IMF for COVID response and to use it for the purchase of incinerators for the managing of garbage disposal. Go back to the estimates. Go back to it, the IMF monies. I heard it's about $20 million. $20 million. Over $20 million Spent by our broke country that could have been spent on laptops, Wi-Fi for communities, food for the elderly and the poor, medicine for the sick and the invalid. Worse, the landfill in Viewfort was only closed because DSH asked it closed, it be, it be closed so they can have a horse race. Clearly putting horses before people. This government failed the people when it did not use money borrowed from CDB to provide support to farmers, bus drivers, fishers, vendors, barbers, hairdressers, and other small businesses. And you had a member from Saltibus Rosel praise his prime minister for taking care of the people, in, people of St. Lucia. Is the honorable member dreaming? He spoke about missing going by the river and those things. Maybe he should go back by the river. To say he's praising the prime minister for taking care of the people of St. Lucia. I can't even go to my barber. Well, he probably doesn't go to a barber anymore, so he won't even know barbers don't open. You know, Mr. Speaker, this government failed to prepare and it failed to act. This cannot be deemed as just a comedy of errors because it involves our lives. People have lost their lives. Mr. Speaker, this can only be described as reckless public policy and bad decision making to the detriment of our people. So where do we go from here, Mr. Speaker? With a pattern of reckless public policy and bad decision making, we are asked to approve an extension of the state of emergency for 90 days. Is this not more recklessness? I have heard the St. Lucia Medical and Dental Association call for judicious lockdown. Yesterday, I heard the CSA call for a total lockdown for a specific period preceded by an adequate notice period and a package of financial and other forms of support for the most vulnerable. And again, I heard the member 
from Mr. Rosel Salkeberg said, we cannot have a lockdown because the businesses pay tax. And if they're not paying tax, we'll have no money um, to run the country. What has happened to over $500 million that has been borrowed for COVID? What has happened to it? And I'm not going to take him on about his, you know, sinking fan and those things, Mr. Speaker. Let's stay focused, Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to ask, Mr. Speaker, why is a state of emergency necessary? And I'm asking... These are questions being asked to me by my constituents. Is a curfew necessary? I think we all agree that we need to stop the present spike in cases. We need to contain it. That is our number one priority. We are told that the fundamental action required is to break the infection cycle. And to do so, we must dramatically reduce the gathering and interactions between people. So I ask a simple question. If we use the COVID Act to implement all the necessary requirements for a national lockdown, do we still need a curfew? Let us reflect on what the COVID Act provides. Powers to control operating hours for businesses. Revocation of licenses, permits, or any authorization for use of public spaces. Suspension of liquor licenses, prohibition of assembly, physical distances, and prohibition of access to any area. If all bars, restaurants, and businesses are closed, if all access to public spaces are prohibited, if all gatherings are banned, if all public interactions are severely limited, then why do we need a curfew? And that's what people are asking. I posit the view that a curfew can always be desirable. But if all other measures are in place, it is certainly not needed from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. In any event, if we want to restrict all gatherings and interactions, then surely we must focus on when people are mostly gathering and interacting. It is not nighttime. Most of the interactions and gatherings are taking place right in front of us during the day. The present orders are illogical and inconsistent. How can we close SNS but allow call centers to be open? And workers have been told not to wear masks when making calls. How can we allow people who are heading to and from the respiratory centers to use public transportation? How can we ask all businesses to close by 7 p.m. but allow some construction work to continue? How can you be asked as the people and blamed for not staying at home, but the leaders of the government are out campaigning and visiting elections projects? There is a simple reason. The government has placed business interests and elections before you, the people, before your lives. The Prime Minister made it clear to us there is no point in saving our lives if we cannot earn money. My people, this government has failed you. But we need a collective pause. We need to take decisive action for a determined short period and stop this spike. We cannot afford a prolonged, relaxed approach for 90 days. That, Mr. Speaker, will only serve particular business interests and the government's desire to enhance its election chances. All the time, our people are suffering and some die. We need, Mr. Speaker, to have a genuine economic and social support program that takes care of our people who are suffering and will be affected. I have come to this house over and over and pleaded for St. Lucians who are affected. More than this, help will be needed. Not just construction workers on road projects. Again, I heard a member from Souza Saltibus boast of the construction work on roads and the Prime Minister in his fleeting appearance last night talk about how many more roads have been built. Tell us what percentage of money spent on roads actually going paying salaries 
And I heard the leader of the opposition speak of $20 million for a Rodney Bay road of two miles. It's not even two miles. It's about half a mile. Between half a mile to one mile. $20 million. How much of that is spent on salaries and the employment of people? Tell me. When you spend $20 million on roads and less than $2 million goes in paying salaries and you want to boast you're doing it for the benefit of the people? And there is a belief in this government that if you help poor people, if you help the vulnerable, then this is mendicancy. You don't borrow money to give away to people. But who gets the money? Who gets it? See, my people, a Labour Party will put you first and seek to protect your life first and then the economy. Because the humane thing is to save lives first. This government has no conscience. You, the people, are seen as collateral. They don't care about you. They have failed you. But we must not fail ourselves. We can and we will play our part to safeguard ourselves. This notion that you are the cause of the problem because you are not staying home and that you are indisciplined must be rejected. Let us show that we can do this and follow the protocols. I appeal to you, all St. Lucians, to follow the basics. Wash your hands, wear your mask, and watch your distance. This is the best you can do. Then we will do what has to be done to change this government whenever elections are called. You can only do as much as you can do. The government is failing you and will continue to fail you. But don't fail yourself. After all, According to the Minister of Health, this government believes it is better for them to do the right thing and be wrong than not to do the right thing and still be wrong. I say to members opposite, we are taught that all of our problems arise out of doing the wrong things right. The more efficient you are at doing the wrong things, the wronger you become. This resolution to extend the state of emergency for 90 days is wrong. Stop doing the wrong things right there. Thank you very much. Member for Barbona. Mr. Speaker, I beg to suspend this Honourable House for 45 minutes. Honourable Members, the question is that the House will stand suspended for the next 45 minutes. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion say aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. How is it suspended? has just been suspended following approval of the continued discourse surrounding the motion read result that Parliament approves the declaration of a state of emergency that was published in the Gazette on the third day of February 2021 as statutory instrument number 27 of 2021 containing a declaration that a public emergency has arisen as a result of the occurrence of 2019 and COVID in the infectious diseases commonly referred to as COVID-19. And for a further period of 90 days commencing the 11th day of February 2021 and ending on the 16th day of May 2021. Uh, Carlton, so far the day has gotten off to a fervent start. We saw uh, the Prime Minister opening the morning and uh, thereafter the Leader of the Opposition, Honourable Philip J. Pierre and uh, Honourable Bradley Felix and uh, as well as the member for Castry South, uh, Honourable Dr. Ernest Hilaire.
un des Daniel qui c'est monsieur qui raconte ici a il a dressé tout le monde qui était ici après ça premier ministre n'a parlé quand nous t'ai dit en commencement c'était pour discuter là il venait pour ajouter 90 jours à ce que l'État est de ce pouvoir. Et puis, nous avons un peu à la pour mieux prendre le leader opposition, il ne va pas, mais il y a un peu de temps à la tout le monde a eu un voie gardé. Il a demandé à cette personne pour suivre le protocole, suivre le jeu, parce que nous tous voulons aller du même côté. Nous ne savons pas des empêcher les politiques, les parler, mais il y a un peu de bien clair, il y a d'accord, nous ne pouvons suivre le jeu de la un bagage ni pour faire l'air vide pour nous avec à contrôler euh, 20 minutes. You are absolutely right. I mean, uh, despite whatever form or shape things eventually take, we do encourage, uh, like the representatives have, encourage persons to adhere to the protocols, um, continue the, the very basic infection prevention measures and the other national COVID-19 protocols to see how we can call this, the, these figures that we've been seeing al most alarmingly. Oui, et je sais, et puis il est bien important que nous ne c'est pour ça que nous toujours dit ici, il est bon pour nous suivre ce qu'il a fait ici, parce qu'il y a eu plus d'informations pour continuer, parce que nous sommes bien copains, là il vient pour argument, est-ce que nous sommes bien, pour qui ça nous est bien, et qui ça nous a fait. Moi, je suis un chien de ce que nous avons dit, et nous avons plus de monde qui a parlé, là il vient pour ces représentatifs, et qui a eu ici à Rodia, là il vient pour nous en simplicité. Est-ce que nous vous avez 90 jours pour ayant été aidé ce coup? Est-ce que nous vous avez que vous avez mis à toujours? Absolutely. The debate on that motion will be continuing after the house resumes later on today, and also there's just one or two motions down for consideration in the honourable house today. We also have the barrel exemption. Uh, that is the value added tax amendment of schedule 3 order that motion is being forwarded by the prime minister as well uh, on on exempting you know, the value added tax uh, to on imports of personal items food clothing uh, toys and other household consumables contained in barrels for the period 1st february all the way to the 31st of march 2021 and we also have the bill down for consideration later on in this sitting the covid 19 prevention and control amendment bill oui, et eh, eh, puis, oui, je sais, eh, les nouvelles ici, ah, oui, parmi l'autre motion pour discuter, eh, nous, car, oui, les venus pour qu'on ne sache pas, oui, et eh, ça, si posé, point coup, aussi, parce que nous, car, oui, ajoutement pour juste bout de ma, um, masse, euh, qui voulait dire, premier ministre, là, il eh, y il ni pour faire un amendement pour section 3, les venus pour, euh, vat là, parce que, oui, un écosse, monde pour mener bien, hard, et puis manger, avec l'autre bagaille, qu'on a ça pour considération, et qu'on a bille, les venus pour COVID, les venus pour contrôler la protection à bas Bill COVID là. Thanks for that, Carlton. And with that, we take you back to studio. Please stay tuned to NTN. The House of Assembly sitting will resume later on today in about an hour's time. And uh, that debate on the two motions and the uh, bill down for consideration will continue in this sitting. Back to studio.